Yo Young Chul, known as one of South Korea's most notorious serial killers, terrorized the nation from 2003 to 2004. As fear gripped the city and the media desperately sought answers, the police were reluctant to admit that a serial killer was on the loose. Yo Young Chul's preferred weapon was a homemade hammer which he used in his horrific killing spree before eventually being brought to justice in a case filled with shocking twists and turns. Before becoming a cold-blooded murderer, Yo Young Chu was no stranger to criminal activities. He had a disturbing criminal record and a history of serving time in prison. This is the story of the unhinged Korean man who brutally killed 26 people, also known as the Raincoat Killer. In 2004, South Korea experienced a chilling pattern. The owner of multiple massage parlors in Seoul noticed a suspiciously familiar trend. Several women who were working under him began to mysteriously disappear. It is not surprising that their absence went unnoticed by family or friends, given their professional background and largely solitary lifestyle. This, unfortunately, rendered them as easy prey. The matter came to light when a male client called the boss of the massage parlor requesting to avail himself of the services of one of his employees. Under normal circumstances, such a call would be deemed ordinary. However, this call originated from the phone of one of the missing women, which raised suspicion. As a result, a sting operation was carried out. The police created a setup where they lured the caller into meeting an undercover officer disguised as one of the girls and successfully trapped him. Upon reaching the destination, Yo Young Chul was apprehended without delay. The police had initially believed it to be a simple kidnapping and human trafficking scenario, but the depth of the barbarity they unearthed was beyond dreadful. During the interrogation, Yuo confessed to ending the lives of more than 20 individuals, a majority of whom were either sex workers or elderly inhabitants of affluence. Later, he led the police to the burial sites of his victims. But what exactly leads a person to perpetrate such inhumane acts? The inception of this narrative takes us back to Yu's childhood, tainted with hardships that would eventually pave his way to committing monstrous crimes later in life. Born in 1970 in Gochang, amidst poverty, Yu Young Chul faced a challenging early life, marred by constant ridicule by his peers due to his family's lower class status. It is speculated that growing up impoverished sparked a resentment towards the affluent in him, as a few of his targets were prosperous. Both he and his sibling were abandoned at a young age by their mother, who left them at their grandmother's residence one day and never came back. However, their lives took an unexpected turn when their father claimed responsibility for them, moving them to his abode with their new stepmother. This did not herald a happy family life, for the stepmother proved to be abusive towards the youngsters. Tragedy further marred their lives when their father died in a traffic accident in 1985, deeply affecting you and his family. This was a critical juncture in Yuo's life, a chance to reshape his destiny. In an effort to break free from poverty, he realized that working hard and achieving success were necessary. However, after applying to an art school and being rejected, he faced another personal setback. By 1988, he had eventually opted for a technical school that would admit him based on his qualifications. Rather than studying diligently, he found a quicker way to earn money by engaging in criminal activities. Unfortunately, Yu wasn't skilled in this area, as he was caught stealing from a wealthy neighbor at only 18 years of age. He was sent to a juvenile detention center, but his punishment didn't stop there. Due to his inability to continue attending technical school, he failed his classes and the entire course. His criminal activities quickly worsened, involving the theft of more expensive items, money, and ultimately cars. However, as with his previous behavior, he was caught in 1990, one after stealing from his landlord. As a result, he served 10 months in prison, reflecting on his actions. Despite having a troubled past, his girlfriend, a masseuse, agreed to marry him, and they had a son together. Instead of embracing family life, Yu reverted to his old habits and went back to stealing. Throughout all the chaos, his wife remained supportive, taking care of their child as he repeatedly engaged in theft and faced multiple arrests. However, the tipping point for her came in 2000, when he was found guilty of raping a 15-year-old girl and sentenced to three and a half years in prison. She eventually filed for divorce while he was incarcerated, citing abuse and alcohol-related issues as reasons. Upon his release in 2003, he embarked on a new and appalling path that would strike fear and create shockwaves around the globe. While in prison, 
Yo developed an admiration for a notorious killer named Zhang Do Yang, who was responsible for the murders of nine wealthy individuals between 1999 and 2000. This seemed to be something he could identify with. His animosity towards the affluent had grown significantly, pinning them as the key cause of his strife. Following his divorce, this hatred had also expanded towards women, inflating his mind with dangerous and dark speculations inspired by his role model, Jung. It was later that Yu suggested that women ought to maintain dignity and the wealthy should be accountable for their actions, possibly a glaring foretoken of the dreadful events yet to unfold. Residing at his mother's residence after divorce, he was granted visiting rights to his son. However, these visits gradually adopted a significantly more sinister undertone. Yo Young Chul had formulated a vengeful plan against his ex-spouse with intentions of executing it in the most brutal way. He planned to eradicate her life and follow it with their sons. And the visitations were the ideal opportunity for him to carry out his gruesome plan. Subsequently, he conceded that he was unable to perform the act due to some form of ethical consideration. His spouse and offspring would endure this sadist. However, he wouldn't demonstrate this kind of hesitance when he came across his next victim, the affluent. To get ready, Yo had to hone his killing skills, and he had a clear strategy in mind. He constructed his own instrument of death, creating a hammer that was powerful enough to kill, modifying the long handle to a shorter one, and tailoring the grip to suit his requirements. Coupled with a knife and gloves, he was equipped to execute what he perceived as his retribution. In order to assess the effectiveness of his makeshift weapon, he began luring stray dogs to isolated forests and would subsequently bludgeon them to death in a brutal, merciless attack. Serial killers often exhibit a disturbing pattern, starting with harming animals and escalating to humans. Yu's story perfectly fits this narrative, and in no time, he found the audacity to enact retribution on those who earned his utmost loathing. Barely a fortnight after gaining freedom on September 24, 2003, Yo set his sinister plan into motion. He chose to operate in the affluent neighborhood of Sensa, Dong, and soon singled out his first victim. The unfortunate soul was Lee Diok, Su, a septuagenarian retired professor who lived with his wife, Yan Ok. Yun announced, Yui invaded their home around 10 a.m. and ruthlessly attacked Mr. Lee in the neck before moving on to his wife. She was assaulted with a hammer until Yu went back to Mr. Lee to finish the job. Surprisingly, after all this, he managed to clean up and leave. He realized he left his knife behind, so he had to break back into the house. You thought that making the scene look like a failed robbery would serve as a diversion for the investigators. However, in another misstep, he wrecked the house without actually taking anything, which drew the police's attention. The investigators also found shoe prints at the scene that would soon become highly recognizable, revisiting the disturbing incidents from 2003, reminding again of the heinous acts committed by Yuu. Not more than a few weeks have passed, and Yuo was back on October 9th, 2003, in Gujidong. Abiding by his usual method, he broke into a wealthy house around mid-morning. Upon stumbling across 85-year-old Mo Kong, he committed a horrifying act before being disturbed by the lady of the house. He coerced her into the living room, asking her to bow her head, seemingly preparing for some inhumane act. However, she did not comply. Once she informed him about the presence of her son and husband, he lost control and claimed another life. Afterwards, he set his sights on her son. It is even more dreadful to note that her son was disabled, presenting a clear picture of the severity of psychopathy Yuo was suffering from. The boy was compelled to kneel by her son, and he was ruthlessly beaten with a hammer until life ceased in him, increasing the victim count to three in not much time. The expected fourth unfortunate victim was not at home in reality. There's ambiguity regarding whether the wife of the homeowner fabricated a lie about her husband's presence to create fear in the invader, or whether she conceived he was home. A distraught father and husband made the tragic discovery of their lifeless bodies. The evidence of footprints identical to those at the last crime scene raised hope for the police. This led them to create a database search intended to reveal the identity of the perpetrator. Yo, however, was nowhere near the end of his spree and he shifted his focus to Samsiong, Dong next. On this occasion, his target was a home inhabited by only one person, the occupant Yoo Joan. He was a 69-year-old mother who came face to face with an intruder in her residence. She was forcibly confined to the bathroom. 
where she was brutally assaulted in an appalling act of violence. Her son, in a stroke of fortune, found her while she was still alive. In spite of the emergency responders' attempts, she ultimately succumbed to her injuries, marking a sorrowful and unnecessary loss of yet another blameless individual. By this point, media outlets had started to notice the close occurrence of these murders and were questioning if there might be a connection between them. The identical footprints found at multiple crime scenes and the similarities in the victim's deaths strongly suggested a link. However, to prevent public panic, authorities refused to admit that the murders were related. It wouldn't be long before Yuo's twisted urges got the better of him once more. On November 18, 2003, he targeted another affluent area, this time in Haiwa Dong Province. While attempting to break into a home, he confronted the caretaker living on site and brandished his knife. He coerced her into directing him to the primary bedroom, where the 87-year-old house owner identified as Kim Jong-suk was believed to be. However, in addition to Kim, Yoa was suddenly met with an unexpected predicament. The owner's infant son was also present in the room. As Yu Young Chu lunged towards Kim with his hammer, the caretaker courageously grabbed the one-year-old child and tried to escape through the door. As you intercepted and bundled up the baby in a blanket, she possibly assumed the worst. Instead of posing a threat to the infant, he relocated him to another room, swaddling him so his crying would catch the attention of the neighbors. With more to address, he redirected his anger towards the caretaker, who tragically didn't survive his onslaught. Again, Yo committed a grave error that required his desperate attempt at concealment. In his habitual act to stage the scene like a botched robbery, he accidentally cut himself hence leaving his DNA for the police to later discover. If you believed that this murderer had any moral compass by sparing the owner's young offspring, then his subsequent action would deeply shock you. To conceal the traces of his blood, he ignited a fire in the house while leaving the baby inside. He then watched from a secure distance as the residence blazed. In what seemed like a stroke of divine intervention, a relative found the infant unharmed amidst the chaos. The fire had consumed the main bedroom and its occupants, sparing the rest of the residents. Scrutiny of the domicile's surveillance footage revealed the back of an individual presumed to be South Korea's emerging serial murderer. The individual had draped themselves in a found garment to conceal the stains of his deeds. This visual provided law enforcement with vital leads, together with a fresh trail of distinctive footprints linked to previous incidents. Suddenly, Yeo ceased his attacks on the city's affluent elders. Perhaps his capture was imminent had he not altered his methods. Yuo, however, had different designs, plotting a course that would inevitably bring him face to face with a new target. After obtaining a police officer's uniform, he started extorting money from escorts in the red light district. Surprisingly, he was quite skilled at this illegal activity and managed to collect enough funds to rent an apartment where he maintained his wild, extravagant lifestyle. Wealthy people triggered Yue's anger, and he soon developed a similar hatred for women when he began dating an escort, whom he later asked to marry him. However, when she found out about his previous marriage and questionable past, she left him, and they never spoke again. This rejection appeared to be Yu Yu's breaking point, seeking revenge. On March 16, 2004, after a brief pause in his murder spree, he went back to the streets with a single objective. Impersonating a police officer once more, he summoned an escort and pretended to arrest her. He took her to his apartment, but this time, she met her fate through strangulation. This painful death marked a clear indication of Yo Young Chul's true sadistic nature. In a sickening turn of events, it's reported that he struck the young woman on the head and suspended the head for blood to drain out. Coming to terms with the realization that his third-story apartment was not conducive for disposing of the remains, he proceeded to dissect her into numerous parts and then concealed them in grocery bags and secreted them behind Sogang University. The area where he hid the girl's remains was marked by him using a bottle cap, but not for the reason you might assume. Rather than marking the spot to come back to it and relish his gruesome act, he did it so as to avoid using the same burial place for subsequent victims. The next victim of Yuu, however, deviated from his pattern as this person was neither affluent nor a call girl. This was indeed a street vendor by the name An J. Sion. After buying counterfeit Viagra that was ineffective, you slipped into his police uniform and apprehended the vendor under the false premise of breaching pharmaceutical regulations. Leveraging the vendor's personal van, he transported both himself and An to a nearby location. An had little time to act if he suspected anything about being transported in his own van as he was soon brutally attacked with stabs to the neck and head. During his struggle for survival, 
On managed to injure you, provoking a violent counterattack. You responded with a hammer, delivering more than 20 fatal blows to On's head. Finding his own traces in the victim's van left him with no alternative but to eliminate the evidence. He torched the van in a nearby parking lot, obliterating both the body and his own DNA. Go soon resumed his gruesome activities, targeting the escorts of the red light district once again. This marked the beginning of a brief yet terrifying killing spree that would claim numerous lives and leave countless families mourning their brutally murdered relatives, all victims of a remorseless psychopath. His later victims were the escorts he would invite to his apartment. There, he would bludgeon them systematically, dismember their bodies, and bury them. He placed a bottle cap atop each burial site as a marker to prevent the accidental unearthing of his macabre trophies. In his subsequent nine slayings, he adhered to the same modus operandi, until the owner of a massages establishment started to detect the unsettling trend of vanishing employees. Yo's lack of foresight, which had led to numerous prior errors, would ultimately contribute to his capture. Several missing individuals were employed at locales owned by a particular businessman, who began to grow suspicious when one girl failed to return from meeting a client. His inquiries, among other establishments, revealed a disturbing pattern. The compilation of missing persons escalated and it was found that one telephone number had been used to engage services from different venues, with those workers subsequently disappearing. Alarmingly, the phone linked to that number belonged to one of the vanished individuals. With a sense of dread, he alerted the authorities. The police, suspecting abductions for human trafficking, devised a strategy to apprehend the offender. When that very number made another call, the plan was set in motion. When the escorts got to the prearranged meeting spot, you called the girl back to cancel the arrangement, just as it appeared like they might have found their suspect. The cause, the girl was too tall. When you consider how you killed a large number of his victims, this makes sense. Even the victims themselves disclose a great deal about the man's mentality. He frequently forced his victims to kneel while showing them indications of submission. Similar to how he selected his victims, he believed that elderly or weak people and gullible escorts would be easier to subdue. He canceled at the last minute because he felt less in control while facing a tall girl. But before long, they'd found the perfect female to perform the role, and he fell exactly for the bait. You found himself encircled by cops before he could react. It came out that he was chewing something furiously, and it was the calling cards of multiple escorts and his mobile phone. It fit the exact phone that the authorities were trying to locate. However, what the alleged thief and kidnapper disclosed to them in the interrogation chamber was far more than they could have ever imagined. When they brought him to the CO Metropolitan Police Agency, they questioned him about what he had done with the females. Although he denied kidnapping and selling them, he admitted to the police that he was the one who killed people in the affluent neighborhood. The confession was unclear to the police, who didn't immediately accept him as credible. He claimed to have killed over 20 people, including an escort, just a few days before his arrest, and to have started with a murder in Sensodong to startle the detectives into taking action. You may not have thoroughly planned his next step, but he made the most of his epilepsy by pretending to have a seizure. Amazingly, the officers let him go of his handcuffs and left him alone with the door wide open, thinking he was incapable of continuing with his plan. Yu was able to flee due to this lack of sufficient care, and he then headed home and started destroying evidence. It's odd that he would confess to the killings in order to remove any proof of them, but it's obvious by now that this person is seriously insane and possibly not thinking well. Within 12 hours after making his getaway, he was discovered by a police officer and was once again taken into custody. With no chance of escape, he did assert that he had consumed the organs of multiple victims, despite his repeated denials of this fact. Some of his victims were found to have missing organs, so this vile evil rumor might perhaps be true, though it was never completely verified. It was during this period that you accepted to lead police to the bodies of his victims and became known as the Rainco Killer. As you can see, the word was more widely used outside of South Korea. It was because he was led around the locations where he had concealed the corpses. He was hiding his identity under a big yellow jacket. The phrase originated in the media, and while having little to do with the actual killings, it became popular and the raincoat killer became well-known worldwide. In actuality, the police units investigating the case drew criticism for their handling of it. The proprietor of the massage business is said to have told their man that he would have kept going until he was stopped. If not, they might never have found him. Thank goodness he was in police custody now and would stand trial for his offenses. 
he made an unwarranted attempt at suicide while in detention and attempted to strike the judge during the trial. He then attempted to attack a bystander while back in court and displayed no regret for the families of the people he had slain. After a long and painful trial, the jury returned an expected guilty judgment, sending this cold-blooded murderer to death row. He's on death row at the moment because South Korea hasn't had an execution since 1997. In fact, the public's opinion was almost unanimous in favor of abolishing the death penalty until this case made headlines. South Korea still has the death sentence in place, even though many people may never see it carried out as a result of this string of gruesome killings and complete contempt for human life. This case still ranks among the worst, if not the most clumsy murder cases in South Korean history. It sends shockwaves throughout the country. We can rest easier knowing you young Chul will live out the remainder of his natural life in a prison cell, even if he is never put to death 